Uh, you're in for a treat tonight. Um, I asked Cole how he wanted to be introduced and he gave me a bio that uh, uh, I'm going to speak from. He says he's uniquely unqualified to speak on photography, uh, which right away makes him uh, somebody I want to hear. Uh, I've never taken a photography class or a workshop. I don't have a degree in art. I've never worked as a photographer. I don't have gallery representation. I'm not a Canon explorer of light. And I only have three lenses and none of them are primes. Do I have any qualifications? Just one, my images, nothing else matters. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Cole, and you'll have to uh, unmute yourself and uh, have fun. Thanks so much, Gary. Thanks all for having me. I'm excited and I'm honored because I am a Canadian at heart. I lived in BC back in the 70s and just loved it. And if I were ever going to relocate, it would definitely be over in BC. So thank you for having me. I'm going to share my screen now and we're going to talk a little bit about black and white tonight. We're going to talk really about my two favorite subjects, black and white and something else. And I'm not, I'm not going to tell you what the something else is. And let's just get started. I'm going to turn off my camera too, so I'm not distracted by looking at myself. So why black and white? To understand black and white, we have to first examine the history of black and white. We need to undertake a comparative and historical analysis with an emphasis on the relative intrinsic value of the inherent intermodal causeways of the medium when compared to other artistic disciplines. Whoa, unfortunately for you guys, this is an incredibly boring part of the presentation. So let's get started. In the beginning, all art was created in black and white. But then color was invented and the world turned colorful. But then photography was invented and the world turned back to black and white. But then Kodak color was invented and the world turned colorful once again. The end. That's about all we need to know about the history of black and white. So how many of you would buy a three-legged dog or get on an airplane with only one wing or buy a car with no wheels? So why then would you take a perfectly good color image and strip it of all color? Why? It would be like owning a Model T in a Tesla world. It would be like using wet plates in a digital world. It would be like owning a three-legged dog, just somehow incomplete. I'd like to tell you about my journey to black and white and why you might consider it. My story begins at age 14. I was living in Rochester, New York. And I was out for a hike one day with a friend and we came across the old shambles of a home. And my friend told me that it had once been owned by George Eastman and that piqued my interest. So I went to the school library and checked out his biography, which tells the history of Kodak. And as I read that book, I just fell in love with photography. And I had this feeling that I was destined to be a photographer. And that sounds silly coming from a 14 year old boy who has never yet taken his first photo, who has never been in the dark room yet to see that magical moment when a print comes up in the developer. But that's how I felt then and that's how I still feel to this day. And so for the next 10 years, everything about my life, literally every waking moment was photography. If I wasn't shooting, I was working in the dark room. And if I wasn't in the dark room, I was studying the works of the great masters. And as I looked at their work, I was always drawn to a particular type of image. They were dark images. They were contrasty images. They were images that I would get a shudder down my spine when I saw something that I loved. And they inspired me. And they made me want to create images just like those. This is my very first fine art image created at the age of 14. A lot of people ask me though, Cole, why black and white? You were born into a color world. And I tell them, no, I wasn't. I was born into a black and white world. When I was a boy, television was all in black and white. 
Movies were in black and white. The news was delivered in black and white. And my childhood heroes were in black and white. And even my nation was still segregated into black and white. And so I created images in black and white. And perhaps those images reflected the world that I grew up in. For me, color records the surface of the image, but black and white reveals the feelings that lie beneath the surface. Or put another way, color is a happy meal and black and white is fine dining. So what do I look for in a great black and white image? As mentioned, I love a dark image. And I love a glowing subject. I love that contrast. I love detail, especially when the detail is enhanced by contrast. I love simple shapes, textures, patterns. And increasingly, my work is becoming more and more simple, minimalistic. And I use a lot of long exposures to simplify my images. Sometimes like water, with water like this image, with sky, and even I'm using increasingly long exposures with people. This is the angel Gabriel. This is what I call my most significant image because it was the very first time I didn't take a picture, but I created an image. As I stood there, I envisioned what the final image would look like. I was photographing on the Newport Beach Pier in Southern California. And it was a crowded, busy day. Hundreds of people are walking past me. But because I was using a 30 second exposure, most of the people disappeared, except for those few ghosts who just lingered for a couple of seconds. And as I looked at the image, it was interesting, but it really lacked a subject. And so I was looking around for someone that I could ask to stand in. And I saw this homeless man eating French fries out of a trash can. And I approached him and I asked him if he would stand in my photograph. I'd be happy to buy him lunch. And he was very wary of me, like he was distrustful of my motives, but he reluctantly agreed. And he wanted to hold his Bible. And this is the image that we used. Ironically, his name was Gabriel, and that's why I named the image the Angel Gabriel. Afterwards, we went to a four-star restaurant, and I imagine walking into a restaurant with a homeless man who's barefoot, filthy, and with matted hair. And as we sat and looked at the menu, I said, Gabriel, order anything that you like. And he said, I'd love a steak with mushrooms and onions. I haven't had one in years. And when the waitress brought it, he picked it up with his hands and ate it. I found out that Gabriel had been a drug addict, but was now clean, but clearly had been impaired by that experience. I also found out that he was Romanian and I'm half Romanian. My real name is Tatar. I was adopted. And so we talked about the old country and my family name. Afterwards, as we were getting ready to depart, I found out that his father lived nearby. And I said, Gabriel, give me the name and address of your father. And if I sell any of these images, I'd be happy to share a portion with you. To which he replied, give it to someone who can really use it. I have everything that I need. And Gabriel walked away with his only two possessions, that Bible and a bedroll. Before COVID, I went back to Southern California three, four times a year, and I would always go back to the Newport Beach Pier looking for Gabriel, but have never seen him again. So how do you learn to photograph in black and white? Well, let me share what I did. First thing I did was put my camera into monochrome mode and raw mode. Now, the and is the most important part there. In monochrome mode, it lets me see the image in black and white on the back of my camera, and that's the best way to visualize. But because I'm in raw mode, the image is actually saved in color. So you get the best of both worlds. Now, why do I want it in color? Because I want to be the one to make the decision of how it's translated into black and white. If you photograph in monochrome and JPEG mode, the camera will make those black and white conversion decisions for you. So you don't wanna do that. This upper left image gives you an idea of what it looked like when I converted this image to black and white myself. And the lower right image is when the camera does it in black and white. So I really want that creative outlet that to change the image from color to black and white myself. Next, learn how colors translate into shades of gray because 
really black and white's all about the contrast. And even more importantly, learn how to manipulate those colors into different shades of gray by using these color sliders in Photoshop when you convert the image to black and white. And I'll show you a lot more about that later. Then think in terms of shapes, contrasts, and composition, because that's all you've got to work with. Without color, a bad image in black and white is readily apparent. So what subjects look great in black and white? I actually think they all do flowers, birds, everything, except one, unicorns. Definitely shoot those in color. Now, tonight, I'd like to give you a sampling of some of my work. I'm gonna share with you images from each of my different portfolios. And interspersed, I'd like to share some of my photographic philosophies. Now let's real quickly talk about what a portfolio is. It's simply a group of images that are related or tell a story. For years, I resisted working in portfolios. I called myself a photographic grazer. I went wherever the grass was greener. And I created some good images, some greatest hits, but they weren't tied together in any way. They didn't tell a story. Well, a few years later, I decided to submit my work to Lenswork, this really cool black and white publication. And the submission guidelines were very simple. Send 15 to 25 images on a single subject and do not send your greatest hits. Well, I thought to myself, he's never seen my greatest hits and off they went. Well, I came back in just a few days with this big hand scrawled note that said, pick one and send me 15 on that subject. And that was the kick in the rear I needed to produce my very first portfolio, grain silos. Now, I think you guys will be able to relate. Where I live, I'm on the edge of the Eastern Plains. And everywhere you turn are grain silos. They're at the center of every family farm and the center of every small town. And so for nine months, I drove around the plains photographing these silos. Not, I hoped, as objects of utility, but rather as objects of art. I love the way the metal gleamed, especially in bright sunlight. So that was my very first portfolio and my very first portfolio in lens work. Now I've heard you don't consider yourself a photographer. No, I think of myself as an artist who uses photography. For 35 years though, I had the mentality of a photographer. As a photographer, I almost worshiped my equipment, more so almost than my image. But as an artist, my God is the image and my camera is simply a tool. As a photographer, my goal was to document what my eyes saw. But as an artist, my goal is to show you what I'm seeing in my head through my vision. There's nothing wrong with documenting. There's nothing wrong with being a photographer but I wanted to do more. I wanted to create. Melting giants. A few years ago, I spent uh, an epic road trip to Nova Scotia. And while there, I just happened to overhear a couple of gentlemen talking about the icebergs in Newfoundland. So the next year off I went, a 9,000 mile, one month road trip. These icebergs begin their life in Greenland where they break off spend nine to 12 months going counterclockwise until they come along the coast of Newfoundland. There they break up into smaller pieces, kind of run ashore, rock on the surf, and then break up into these 50,000 year old ice cubes. And I thought that a terribly short life and a sad story. So I created these images in black and white, not color, and made them very dark and very contrasty. This was my favorite iceberg of the group, just a beautiful shape, I thought. Now, these are the conditions that I actually worked in. And to give you a sense of scale, if you look at that iceberg on the horizon on the right-hand side, it's probably four or five times as large as an aircraft carrier, just enormous. But then they break into these size pieces where they run aground, rock in the surf, and melt on shore. Ansel Adams. Anyone of my generation almost worshiped Ansel Adams. He was our photographic hero. He made photography popular to the masses. And I loved his work so much that I was continually trying to imitate his style. And I even went beyond that. I used to go to Yosemite 
try to find where he stood on his iconic images, and I tried to recreate his images. The greatest compliment anyone could give me is if they were to look at one of my images and say, your work reminds me of Ansel Adams, and I would beam with pride. Well, a few years later, I went to review Santa Fe. That's where you spend a, a day going from table to table, showing your work to experts in the field with the hopes of being discovered. And I got to the last reviewer of a very long day. He was tired, I was tired. I showed him my work. He looked at it very briefly, brusquely pushed it back to me and said, it looks like you're trying to copy Ansel Adams. And I said, I am, I love Ansel Adams. He then uttered something that would shake my world, that would change my photography and my life. He said, Ansel already did Ansel. What can you do that exhibits your unique vision? Wow, talk about an epiphany. I suddenly realized was that my life's ambition to become known as the world's greatest Ansel Adams imitator. Can you imagine Gary introducing me tonight? I'd like to introduce Cole Thompson. He is the foremost imitator of Ansel Adams. Or did I have something to say of my own? Monoliths. <coughs> Excuse me. Every year, I go down to the central Oregon coast to a small town called Bandon, Oregon. Excuse me, I'm going to cough again. <coughs> what I love about Bandon, Oregon is it's got this two-mile stretch of beach with these incredible monoliths stick straight up out of the sand. They call them sea stacks. And so every year I go back and photograph these monoliths. Every year the weather is a little bit different. Every year the light is a little bit different. But most importantly, every year my vision is a little bit differently. So every year I come home with something new. So vision, what is it? I'd heard the, use, the word used before. I kind of knew what it meant, but I didn't know exactly. Was it a style that you develop? Is it a look or a technique? Is it a creative talent that you're born with? Is it something that some people have and others do not? And it turns out that it's none of those things. Vision is simply the sum total of our life experiences that allows us to see the world in a unique way. We're all different. Let me illustrate it a different way. Imagine if you took everything that you believed, everything that you had been taught, everything that you had experienced and put it into a blender. Then you took that mix and you cast lenses that you then saw the world through. What you see through those life lenses is your vision. It's a unique view. It's how you see the world. It's how you like the world. It's how you imagine the world. Vision is not learned or developed. You can't go take a course on it, come out with a certificate and your vision. But rather, vision is discovered and followed. And why do I say discovered? Because the most important thing I learned about vision is that we all have one. In fact, you can't not have a vision. It's simply the way you see. Why is vision so important? Because it's the difference between an average image and a great image. It's what gives your image its spark of life. It's what puts your mark on it. Trees from a train. A few years ago, or excuse me, many years ago, I shouldn't say a few, I lived in Alaska, and I regret that I never returned. Well, last October of 19, a friend called me up and said, I've got one of those two-for-one ticket deals. Would you, I'm going to Alaska. Would you like to join me? And I jumped at the chance. The one thing I really wanted to do, and he agreed, was take the train ride from Fairbanks to Anchorage. It's 12 hours long through the, some of the most rugged mountains of Alaska, the most isolated place where there's no roads. And we were so fortunate that day to have a big snowstorm. 
Now, the very first thing I do when I get on a train is get a window seat. And then you get your camera out and you start looking, what can I photograph? And you very quickly realize this is going to be pretty tough. Things are speeding by at 35 to 50 miles per hour. The trees are cut very close to the rail line. And if you do get a clear view of a distant shot, it's quickly gone. So I went between two cars, opened up both doors, and began shooting out each side. The most obvious thing to begin shooting was the trees because there were so many of them whizzing by. And then I started panning the camera with the trees. Then I thought to myself, well, what would happen if I used a long exposure and panned with the trees? And I started getting these effects that just blew my mind. This swirling action that I just couldn't account for. And so for the next 12 hours, I just spent the time playing with the camera, changing my settings, changing my techniques to see how I could manipulate those swirls. I later discovered the real key was that I had a focal plane shutter, a moving slit that moves across the film plane. So I've got the slit moving across the film plane, I've got my camera being panned, and I've got the movement of the train. All three combined created these incredible effects. And this image was on the two issues of Go of lens work. So how did I find my vision? I, I didn't even understand what vision was, so how could I find it? I first went to Google and typed how to find your vision. Couldn't find a thing. So I just made up 10 things that I thought, I just instinctively thought that would help me find out if I had a vision. Here's a few of them. First thing I did is I printed out my favorites and I divided them into two piles, work that I really, really loved and everything else. Now that might sound like a simple exercise, but it wasn't for me because I had a hard time distinguishing what I loved from what other people loved. The more that other people loved one of my images, the more I started loving it. So I had to try to wipe that away and say, no, what is it that I love? And then I looked not for similarities, but I asked myself for each image, what is it about this image that I love? Next, I committed to never again produce work that I didn't love. If I were in Bandon, Oregon, and I saw some sunrise that I knew would sell well, but I didn't love, I passed. I had to remain pure to what I loved. Next, I practiced photographic celibacy, a controversial practice where I don't look at other people's work. I was so imitative and so influenced by what others were doing and I wanted to find my vision. I reasoned that if I was going to find it, I had to quit immersing myself in other people's vision. I've been doing that now for 15 years. I changed my mindset from photographer to artist. Uh, this, this was hard because for 35 years I had been a photographer and I had this mentality that I was not supposed to manipulate an image. And in addition, I really lacked confidence in my ability to be creative. So to call myself an artist was just fraud in my mind. And the hardest of all, I had to stop caring what other people thought of my work. I had to stop creating for likes and for wins and for judges. I had to say, what do I love? And I don't care what anyone else thinks. It took me two hard, gut-wrenching years to finally find my vision, but I found it. Now, I'd like to try to illustrate, because it's so hard to describe what vision is. So maybe if I illustrate it by showing you some before and after images, I'm going to show you what my eye saw and then show you what my vision saw. Let's start with the angel Gabriel, my most significant image. As I stood there, I knew what the final image would look like. That helped me. It was a roadmap that helped me with the shot and most importantly, Help me with the post-processing. This is called skeleton found along the river in my hometown. And as I stood looking at the scene with the very bright leaves and the bright bones, that's not what I saw. I saw a very dark scene with those bright contrasty bones sticking out. And I didn't know exactly how to do that yet, but I never let that stop me. I, I know once I have an image in my head, I'll figure out how to reproduce it. And this is called windmill in moonlight shot above Grand Island, Nebraska. The challenge of this image 
was that I had an almost full moon with freshly fallen snow. So I had a tough exposure scene. Uh, I, eventually what I finally did was took one exposure for the sky and another for the foreground and then simply cut and pasted them together in Photoshop. Now, some people will say to me, after seeing your before and after images, I realize I need to learn a lot more about Photoshop. And that is exactly not my point. Some people think you've got to have all these technical skills before you're able to express your vision. Boy, I cannot tell you how much I disagree with that. I say, find your vision and then get the skills that you need to express it. I can tell you that probably 50% of the time, I don't know how I'll do it, but I trust that I'll find a way. When I created the series, The Ghost of Auschwitz-Birkenau, I didn't know how I was going to create those ghosts, but I had a vivid vision of what I needed to do. And as you can see, I was really so far away from the final image, it's not funny. But I trust that I'll find a way because I know what I want it to look like. This is one of the melting giants, my favorite one. I loved his shape, but here was the problem. He was rocking so badly in the surf, I couldn't do a 30 second exposure. So I simply took a still image and trusted I would later figure out how to turn that into a long exposure. And I did. It has the exact same look as any of the other long exposure images. And lastly, this is from my Powerline series in Idaho. And when I saw this image, a lot of people might have chosen to do it in color, but I just saw it very dark with that high contrast. Follow your vision. Uh, my post-processing is extremely simple. I typically am only using six tools in Photoshop, and I figure there's about 2,500 different settings and tools and brushes and things in Photoshop. I use six of them. These are the six steps. Now I'm going to demonstrate it. And I'm not suggesting this is how you should process your black and white images, but I want to illustrate that you don't need to have a complicated post-processing procedure and you don't need to have an encyclopedic knowledge of Photoshop. I certainly don't. Step one, you'll notice the images in color. Do you guys remember why? Because I shot in raw. And so it comes in as a color image. And I simply play around with these color sliders until the image looks as close to my vision as possible. Step two, I convert it to black and white. And this is where the fun begins. Using these color sliders, I can drastically change what that image looks like. It's like applying color filters after the fact. And it's an amazing tool. Let me illustrate. These four images are all the exact same image. The only thing I did differently was change two color sliders in each image. Look at how different each one looks simply by dragging two color sliders one way or the other. Three, I adjust levels. Now what levels are, it's simply how good of a black and how good of a white you have. And a lot of people judge that by looking at the image. And if you look at my image, it looks pretty white and it looks pretty dark. But let's look at the histogram and see what it tells. The histogram tells the true story. And in this image, I do not have a true black and I do not have a true white. And with black and white, you got to start there. Well, for my style of black and white, I should say. So I simply drag these two sliders over and I immediately have a true black and a true white, a critical step. Next, number four, dodge and burn. Anyone who has worked in a dark room knows what I'm talking about. I simply can control any small area of the print. I don't need to use a global tool that changes everything. And how I do that is I use a pen and a tablet. And I can work in very small areas. So what I did was I burned down the sky to give me a dark and vignetted sky. And then I increased the detail in those frothy white highlights of the foam. And I didn't like all the distracting detail here, so I burnt that down so it went to black. You have really, really fine control over the image with dodging and burning. Number five, I added contrast, and why? Well, I like contrast, but that's not the reason why I added it. 
when you print an image, it often looks flat. It'll look great on the monitor, but it looks flat when printed. And that's just the nature of using a paper versus a monitor. So to, to compensate, I add additional contrast, and that helps it look almost as good as the monitor image. And then number six, the sixth step, I simply spot the image because I always have a lot of spots because I never clean my sensor. There's your before and after. Six steps in Photoshop. It's a relatively simple process. Now, popular photography called me the Photoshop heretic because they say I break every rule. What they were really saying is, I don't use any tool the way it was probably intended. And I used to be so embarrassed about my super simple post-processing, I would never let any of my photographer friends see me work because they're talking about their very complicated processes with plugins and layers and curves and all this stuff that I still to this day don't know how to do. But then I realized the only thing that matters is the final image. And there is no wrong way to use Photoshop. Now I'd like to share the most important secret to post-processing knowing what you want to do, not knowing how to do it. The how is easy. Anyone can learn Photoshop techniques, but having that vision as a roadmap. When I'm standing there before the scene, I always know what the image is going to look like before I take the shot. That is the key to great post-processing. Isolated. Isolated is a very simple portfolio about isolation told with trees. Now, this is an open portfolio, meaning I've not completed it. It's been going on for years, and I love having a couple. I have several of these open portfolios because when I travel around the world, no matter where I go, I can find something to include in one of my open portfolios. And these are from all over the world. This is from, this is the Hopewell Rock. From New, in New Brunswick at the Bay of Fundy. Uh, it is the, has the world's highest tide, over 55 feet. It's amazing. And when I got there, I wanted to shoot it at high tide. But when I got there, it was low tide. And it was much lower than this. It went way out. And I had to wait for more than 12 hours till after midnight until it was high tide. I positioned myself down at the bottom step going into the bay. And by the time the tide was fully up, it was covering parts of my tripod. And it was so dark after midnight that I had to use an eight minute exposure and a flashlight to provide detail on those side hills. But I got the shot. So people ask, when you go to a new location, how do you prepare? <clears throat> I don't. I literally do two things when I go to a new location. I buy a plane ticket, I rent a car. What I don't do is book any hotels. I don't want to be tied down to any location. I do not look at other photographers' work. And I don't look at any guidebooks that will direct me to the must-see sites. Why? Because they've been photographed a billion times by a million other people. And that's how I approached Iceland. Rented a car and went for a month and just drove around. Did I miss the iconic sites? Thank goodness I did, but I also hope that I created some of my own iconic sites. Now, ironically, I was driving around, saw this great scene, photographed it, came home and found out that it was, in fact, an iconic site. But I didn't know that, and I hope I approached it with my own look. I didn't know how anyone else had photographed it. One thing I really wanted to do, I've got this thing about icebergs, and I wanted to go to that bay where all the icebergs float out to sea. But when I got there, they were having the storm of the century. I hit winds of 137 miles per hour. And as I drove along, I hit an alluvial gravel field, and all the rocks were picked up and thrashing my car. It blew out all the windows, stripped the car of paint. And I was creeping along with zero visibility following the stripe in the road. And then the, the stripe would disappear, and I literally didn't know if I was still on the road. Well, it wasn't until I got home, a friend sent me this from the local paper. The top coat of the asphalt had literally blown away, and that's why I would lose the stripe from time to time. Do you dance? 
I heard this story on the radio told by a physician. He was working on the Navajo Indian Reservation, working in their emergency room one Saturday when an old man with long braided gray hair came in and just stood and stared off into the distance. The physician picked up his clipboard, went over to the old man and said, can I help you? And the old man said nothing, he just stared. And a little bit perturbed, the physician said, look, I can't help you if you won't talk to me. And the old man turned and looked at him and said, do you dance? Well, this caught the physician off guard and he pondered that for a moment. He wondered if perhaps this wasn't a medicine man who believed in healing through dance and song. And so he replied, no, I don't, can you teach me? And the old man said, I can teach you to dance, but you must hear the music. I thought about that story and I thought about it for two reasons. Let me tell you the first. A few years ago, my wife decided that we needed to spice up the marriage a bit by going out dancing. So she signed us up for dance lessons. And as we began our lessons, it became very clear that she and I learned much differently. I memorized the dance steps, stared blankly off into the distance, and repeated one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, very stiffly. My wife learned by closing her eyes, feeling the music, and swaying with the music. I remember the first time we went out dancing for our very first time. She whispered in my ear, are you going to whisper, or are you going to speak out loud all night, count out loud all night? The other reason I thought about this story was as we as photographers, we can learn the technology of photography with our mind. We love to learn about all the technical things, f-stops and depth of field and all the things that we just love, but we must hear the music. Otherwise, all we're doing is taking pictures not creating images. Harbinger. My number four son, Jem, was 13 and we were on a father and son outing. We were out in the summer in Eastern Utah, driving on the highway when I saw these great mud hills off to the north. And I told my son we were gonna stop and he immediately starts complaining. How long are you gonna be? And he asked if he could stay in the truck and watch a movie. And I said, no, it's way too hot. You need to come with me. So we march up these hills and we began photographing, all the while my son complaining. How much longer can we go now? You said 10 minutes, 10 minutes ago. Well, what I was photographing was kind of interesting. I love the symmetry of the hills, but it lacks something. And so my son was complaining so much, I finally just said, okay, I give, let's go back to the truck. We get back to the truck and I look back over my shoulder at those mud hills and I notice there is a single white cloud traveling along the top of the hills, moving very quickly. And then in just a minute, it would be over those hills that I had been photographing. So I yelled, we're going back and we race back up that hill. I get the tripod out, we get the camera up and I get off one shot. And I always name my images the first thing that comes to mind. And it was Harbinger, an omen of things to come. And I loved that image and people loved it. And they'd ask me, are you going to do a series on harbingers? And I just chuckle. I'd say, what are the chances? What are the chances I'm going to see single clouds over appealing landscapes? But you know, when you become aware of something, you start to see them not everywhere, but frequently. And now I've got a collection of harbingers, my favorite portfolio perchance farm all over the world and it's certainly an open portfolio. I just added this one recently. And this also was included in lens work. I, I love this portfolio. I learned a lesson about clouds. I lay in this field for over two hours in Nebraska waiting for that cloud to center itself over the windmill, but it never did. And I learned that some clouds move across the sky like that very first one that I shot but other clouds stay in the same place, forming and dissipating, forming and dissipating. And I'm glad that cloud never did center itself because I think I like the image much better this way. Now, how important is your equipment when creating an image? Not nearly as important as we think. Not nearly as important as your vision. A story. A famous photographer was invited to dinner by a wealthy New York socialite. 
She greeted him warmly at the door and said, I love your work. You must have a wonderful camera. He said nothing. After the meal was finished, he thanked her profusely and said, that was a delicious meal. You must have a wonderful stove. Now, I hope we all smile just a bit because we all found that a great stove does not make a great meal. Yet how come sometimes we as photographers act as though it's our equipment that is the key to a great image? If I only had this camera or that sensor or this lens. If I had to choose between the world's greatest equipment, but I couldn't have my vision, or a Kodak Brownie with my vision, I will take the Kodak Brownie because I am completely confident I can create great images with that camera. A few years ago, I was in St. Petersburg, Russia, and I spent all afternoon photographing this row of trees at the Winter Palace. And when I got home, I was disappointed that not one of the shots was to my liking. And then I remembered I had taken a single image with my eight megapixel small sensor iPhone. And I got that image out, cropped it, worked it, and ended up with this image. Equipment is not as important as we think it is. Ukrainians with eyes shut. My number two son, Cody, was stationed in Ukraine in the Peace Corps. And so my wife and I went off to visit him. And as is my practice, I made no preparations. I did no research about what I would see in Ukraine. I just trusted I would see something that would inspire me, light a fire. And I'd come home with a project. Well, I'm in about day three and I haven't seen anything yet. And I'm starting to get a bit worried. Now I'm counting down how many days left. The people were interesting, as they are in every land. But the problem I always have photographing people in a foreign country is that they put on a camera face, that big smile. And you don't have time to get to know them to break down that camera face, nor do you have a common language. So as I was pondering this problem, I was standing at a bus stop, and I saw an old man leaning against the wall. And I approached him and I tapped on my chest. I said, America. He nodded. I held up my camera. I said, photographer. He nodded. I then did the universal symbol for, can I take your picture? He nodded and I took his picture. Then using sign language, I said, stop, close your eyes. And he scrunched his face up saying, what? And I did it again, close your eyes. And I took his picture and it got rid of that camera face. And so for the next two weeks, I walked around the streets of Ukraine, stopping people and through sign language, asking if I could take their photo with their eyes closed. And it was a wonderful experience. I met several friends that I still correspond with to this day, some 15 years later. Saw this gentleman after I published this work, people would send me photos of him all over Europe. Now I was in Lviv photographing, and this little old man, five foot nothing, shuffled up to me in very broken Italian English, asked what we were doing. And we explained, and he shuffled away without a word. A few minutes later, he came shuffling back, this time with a camera. And he said, can I take your picture? I said, sure. And he said, with your eyes closed. And I'm so grateful that he did that. Because at that moment, I realized how trusting you have to be to shut your eyes for a stranger on the street. My thoughts, even though I knew what he was doing, immediately went to, is this a trick? Is it a joke? Are my possessions safe? So I'm so grateful for the kindness of those Ukrainian people who close their eyes to a stranger. Cole's rule of thirds. I was exhibiting a body of work in Boulder, Colorado, when a woman came up and stood next to me and pointed to one of my images and said, you know, that image doesn't follow the rule of thirds. And this one, you should never put your horizon on the center line. And I was incredulous. Incredulous that she couldn't see my images. She could only see rules not followed. And so sort of in jest, I came up with Cole's rule of thirds, which states a great image consists of one third vision, 
one third the shot and one third processing. But it's the vision that is driving the shot and driving the processing. Sometimes we as photographers get a little out of balance. We put so much emphasis on the technical and very little on the vision or creative end of it. For years, I only focused on the shot and the processing. And what I created was technically perfect, but soulless snapshots. Helen Keller said, it's a terrible thing to see and have no vision. The Lone Man. I was photographing in Southern California, in San Diego, at the La Jolla Cove, specifically at the children's pool. And they've got this great stone jetty that sticks out. And I wanted to do a long exposure of the waves moving against the stillness of that jetty. But it was a crowded, busy day, and there were a lot of people out on that jetty. And I kept waiting for them to leave long enough I could get a 30-second exposure, but I couldn't. So I was a little bit frustrated. I just decided to go ahead and get a test shot so that when people left, I could be ready. So I did a 30-second exposure, and I was very surprised to see that everyone on the end of that jetty disappeared because they were moving, except for that one guy who stood perfectly still for 30 seconds. Then I realized I had seen that body posture before. I had seen this attitude before. When people stand on the edge of the world and look out into the great expanse, they become still and pensive and they think about things greater than self. They think about how small they are and how large the world is. They think about what's the purpose of life? Where do I go after this? Do I matter? And I call that moment when they're alone and still with their thoughts, that they're the lone man. And people will ask, how'd you get them to stand still for 30 seconds? They don't even know I'm photographing them. They just naturally stand still. This was taken in January of 2020, right before COVID hit, my last trip. And this is one of my favorites, simply because that is my daughter-in-law up there. This is the Faroe Islands. And that cliff she on has got to be three miles high. And I'm about that same height on the edge of another cliff. And it made me nervous because my son was there with their child and there are no guardrails. And this is a perilous place. Several tourists do fall to their death every year. A lot of my photographer friends like to engage in these esoteric discussions on such subjects as what is art? What is fine art? And I wanted to weigh in with my thoughts. Who cares? I only ask myself two questions. Do I like it? And would it look good on my wall? A few years ago, I had a high school senior call me up and ask me if I would do her senior portrait. And I was about to say no. I didn't do that type of work. But then she said something that caught my interest. She said, I want something unusual, something that no one else has ever done. And so I said, great, I'll do it. And we created this image, which I called Ingrid Surrounded. And I happened to show that to a friend of mine who's got an MFA. And he said to me, well, you know, Cole, that actually isn't a fine art image. And I said, well, Russ, I never claimed that it was, but tell me why. I thought maybe there was a cow rule or something. And he said, because everyone knows that in a fine art image, the subject never smiles. And I thought, how pompous and how silly. I say, create what you love, no matter what other people think or what other people call it. Sometimes others may not understand or even like my work, and that's okay. I didn't create it for them. Well, at least I shouldn't create it for them. Moy Standing. When I was 17 years old, I read Thor Heyerdahl's book, Aku Aku. He was a great adventurer and I just fell in love with all of his pieces, his works, but this one in particular, The Secret of Easter Island, how they moved those giant stone statues across the island. Well, when my wife and I were creating our bucket list a few years ago, I just happened to say out loud, you know, I'd love to go to Easter Island, but of course that's impossible. And my wife said, why? And the very next year off we went. 
And while there, I created three portfolios, and this is one of them. There are over a thousand moi on Easter Island, but only 30 still stand. They stand on these ahus or altars, and they're sacred to the Rapa Nui, so you don't get close to them or stand on them. And of all those thousand, though, only 30 remain. And this guy has the tallest moi on Easter Island. It's that guy right there. And when he had his top knot on, he was even much taller. And just to give you a sense of scale, look to his right, and you'll see a little horse down there at the bottom. Now, Thor Heyerdahl thought the mystery of Easter Island is how they move these guys. But I really disagree. I think the mystery is why, seemingly in a day, they drop their tools, they lay right next to the moi, and they walked away, never completing the majority of them. We'll never know why. Now, one of the things that I love to do when I go to a new land is meet the dogs because I'm a dog lover and I kind of judge the people by their dogs. For example, when you go to Moscow, do not pet a stray dog because you will be bit, you will be getting rabies shots. Ask my son. But in Easter Island, all of the dogs are strays and they are the most gentle, kind and loving fellows, which I think reflects well on the people. What they do is they hang out at the Ahus and they beg for food. And we fell in love with this old guy. We named him Graybeard. He was a mangy old thing, but we just loved him. So every day my wife and I would come here twice a day to feed and water Graybeard. So how do I pick a subject for a portfolio? I don't, it picks me. For years, I kept in my breast pocket a list of over 50 ideas that I would jot down every time I had a new one until I realized that I had never once created a project from those written ideas. Every project came about in this lightning bolt of inspiration that just got me passionate. And I'd like to tell you about one called ceiling lamps. My mother lived in Akron, Ohio, and I was back visiting her and I was checking out of the hotel to return home when I just happened to look up at the ceiling. And I don't know why, but at that moment, on that day, the lamp that I saw just fascinated me. And I moved the table out of the lobby and lay down on the floor and looked at that lamp. And then I got my camera out and I started photographing it. And then I started doing that everywhere that I went, finding these lamps and shooting them from straight below. And just had a blast doing it because they're so abstract. I don't think anyone would ever know these were ceiling lamps. And, I, and the thing is, at my age, I'm so forgetful, but I can remember every one of these lamps and what the story was and where they were. This is at my favorite Mexican restaurant in Fort Collins. And that one in the upper right, that's at a Del Taco in Costa Mesa, California, taken on the same day I photographed the Angel Gabriel and just had fun arranging them in different ways. And then I was in Moscow not long ago and photographed these three great Soviet era ceiling lamps in the subway. And you have to be careful there because if you do anything odd, boy, the military police are on you. So you kind of have to shoot and quickly get out of the way. So someone had asked me why I create, and I pondered that for a long time. And I remembered back when I was a 14 year old boy, why I created back then, just the pure joy of creating for myself, creating something that I loved. But it didn't take long to see that I could get a lot of positive feedback from my images. So I started creating just for the pats on the back. And then I argued that you didn't know an image was good unless it won. So I tried to start winning contests. Then I went into the phase of no one would ever take me seriously if I didn't have an extensive resume. And you know what? Today, I don't even keep a resume. Then I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be the next Ansel Adams. Then I went through my money-making phase. And you know what? 50 years later, I have come full circle to once again create for the same reason I did as that 14-year-old boy, just to please myself. And sometimes I'm pretty sad that it took me 50 years to learn that lesson. But ultimately, I'm just grateful that I did learn it. The truth is, I do my best work when I'm creating for myself with no thought of how others will receive it. Linda Ronstadt said, 
I mean, it's nice to be acknowledged, nice for your work to be acknowledged, but it's not what you do it for. You do it for the work. And if you're doing it for the prizes, you're in big trouble. Amen, Linda. The Fountainhead. Another book I read as a teenager was The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, which had a huge influence in how I think and my vision. The Fountainhead's the story of an architect who wants to create these modernistic buildings in a neoclassical world. And the other architects are constantly trying to sway him to create like they create. And the art critics, or the architectural critics just hammer him and they just do everything they can to bring him to his knees but he refuses. He has a vision of what he wants to design and he won't give in. Big influence in my life. Well, a few years ago, I was in downtown San Diego in stop and go traffic and there was a car in front of me with a tinted window. And in that window, I could see the reflection of the skyscraper behind me, except for that skyscraper was wonderfully distorted, very modernistic. And I loved the look and I went home and told my wife about it and we pondered how to recreate that look. And it was my wife who came up with the idea. She had the idea of using a ferrotype plate or a metal mirror, a funhouse mirror that you could bend, twist and distort. And so I went around all these great cities going to their downtowns, photographing the skyscrapers reflection in a warped mirror. And I could get these incredible distortions. Now this is me working. And the reason I have to lay on the ground is that the mirror wants to put you in the image. So you have to get below it. But it was a fun project. And uh, my favorite image was from Portland, Oregon. This one. So what photographic rules should you follow? There's a lot of them. None, unless you want to create average images just like all the other images made by the people following the same rules. Remember paint by number? We were promised that if we followed the rules, we could create a masterpiece. And the rules were simple. Use the right color in the right number and stay within the lines. Well, maybe not a masterpiece, but a competent imitation of a masterpiece. You don't create a masterpiece by following the numbers or by following the rules. At best, all you'll produce is a crude imitation. Ansel Adams said, the so-called rules of composition are, in my opinion, invalid, irrelevant, immaterial. And an ex-Ansel Adams imitator said, there are no need for rules when you have found your vision. The Dunes of Nude. Every year I go to Death Valley in January. Why January? Because the temps are about 65 to 70 degrees and the crowds are all gone. And I spend most of my time on the dunes. I love those first two and three hours at sunrise and the last couple of hours at sunset. Why? Because the shadows are very long and low and the contrasts are just unbelievable. And so I spend my days in the warm sun, laying on the dunes sometime, just contemplating life. And like my other open projects, I always come back to the same spot, but always come home with something a little different. Now I'd like to share the absolute key to a great image. It's not your camera. It's not how big your lens is. It's not the settings that you use. It's not your location at all. It's not your software, your plugins, or your actions. It's certainly not the rules that you follow. It's not how long you've been photographing. And it's not your title. The key is your vision. That's more important than any technique any skill, any camera. Vision first creates the image in my head and then my skills execute that vision. Sugimoto said, if I have a vision, my work is almost done. The rest is just a technical problem. 
Linney, A Portrait of Breast Cancer. Linny was a customer. She bought the Angel Gabriel from me. And then about a year later, she calls me up on the phone and says, I've got breast cancer. I've had a mastectomy and I want you to photograph me. And I said, Linny, I am so sorry. You know, I really don't do that type of work. She goes, I don't care. I want you to do it. Linny, let me give you the name of a woman I know who specializes in this type of work. No, it'll be fine. I want you to do it. Lenny, I don't have the right equipment. I don't have lighting skills. I don't have any skills in this area. It will be okay. I want you to do it. She was insistent that these images would be useful to other women. So I went to Grand Junction to photograph Lenny. Lenny was beautiful. She was dignified, but it was a tough subject, a personal subject. And I felt very uncomfortable and I can't imagine how Lenny felt. And all through the shoot, I just had this one question I wanted to ask her, but I was afraid to, afraid that it would spoil the mood of the shoot. But finally, as we were kind of getting ready to wrap it up, as we were nearing the end, I finally summoned up my courage and asked her, Lenny, what's your prognosis? And as I snapped this picture, she said, I'll be dead by Christmas. That was some 15 years ago and Lenny is still with us. She got into an experimental program and survived and now has a new lease on life. And now she has hair and she's insisting I come back to photograph her. And I can bet you a dollar she will not let me off the hook. Don't know if you ever experienced this, but people are always telling me what I should do with my images. Sometimes they're a little polite about it and they'll say, well, if this were my image. But other times they're rather blunt. Here's what you need to do with your image. I say don't follow other people's advice, not about your vision. Let me tell you a story about the angel Gabriel. I'm excited about this image because it's the first time I had visualized and executed that vision. So I very excitedly show it to my mentor. First words out of her mouth, don't center the subject. You're always doing that, Cole. And I keep telling you, don't center the subject. Well, I've got a quandary now. There's the way I'm seeing it and feeling it, but here's my expert mentor telling me something else. So I went home and tried cropping the image and I hated it. I almost got physically ill and to this day, look at that image and get mad. This is how I saw that in my head. This is my vision and my image. She might've done it differently, but it's my image. There are no experts when it comes to your vision. Another story, a photographer was exhibiting his work for the very first time. In attendance was a well-known art critic and he approached the photographer and said, would you like to hear my opinion about your work? Sure, said the photographer, let's hear it. It's worthless, said the art critic. I know, said the photographer, but let's hear it anyway. Now, I hope some of you out there are chuckling. You are the only expert when it comes to your vision. Don't listen to anyone else and don't ask other people what you should do with your images. People all the time will write me and say, Cole, what would you do with this image? I said, look, it doesn't matter what I would do. And if I gave you my opinion and you followed it and you kept following it, soon your work would look like my work. And believe me, you don't want that. Cole did Cole. What can you do that exhibits your unique vision? Confucius say, they who walk in another's footsteps never finds their own path. Moy, sitting for portrait. This is a second portfolio I did while on Easter Island. Getting to Easter Island is not easy. We went from Toronto, excuse me, Denver to Toronto, to Santiago, to Easter Island. They call this the most remote, isolated place on earth. That long leg, Toronto to Santiago was a killer and I fell asleep and dreamt. I dreamt that I had brought these two stands and a giant roll of paper and had set up an outdoor studio. And then I went around and invited each of the Moy to come sit for a portrait. In my dream, they were alive and they were distrustful of outsiders with good reason. 
They had been so poorly treated in the past. So many declined. Some said they were too old. Some said they were too infirm. Others said they didn't want to run into family members whom they had a dispute with. And ultimately, I didn't really know if anybody would show up on the day of the shoot. The day of the shoot came and initially, no one did come. But later, some of the younger ones came and started allowing me to photograph them. And as word got out, more and more of the Moy came and sat for a portrait. Well, I woke up from that dream and told my wife about it. Um, and I thought about it for a while. I finally told her, I said, you know what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to invite the Moy to come sit for a portrait. And I did invite them. And they did come. And it was a great success. Now, of course, the Moy really didn't come to me. I came to them. I would photograph them. As soon as a cloud would come over, I'd photograph them in the shade. And then I would drop them into a digital backdrop that I created. And using dodging and burning, I'd try to recreate the look of a studio lit situation. This was a fun project because these moi are so, you know, at first all the moi look alike to you, but as you study them more and more, you realize they have quite a bit of differences between them. And some speculate they might represent a leader or perhaps even the artist. Fun project and inspired project. Just let go. Letting go was one of the biggest keys to finding my vision. Letting go of what? I call them vision blockers, things that stop us from seeing through our own eyes. Letting go of what other people thought of my work. Letting go of conforming. Letting go of following the rules. Letting go of worrying if others would like my work. Letting go of trying to win of trying to get likes on social media, letting go of photographing the right way, letting go of trying to please others, letting go of other people's expectations, and the hardest, letting go of the fear of criticism. That's a hard one. In other words, letting go of everything. In other words, not caring what anyone else thinks of your work. And once I did that, I was free. And believe me, it is a wonderful feeling because you now create anything you want in any way that you want. And you don't worry about it if others like it or if they think you're doing it the right way. It's the ultimate freedom. Free to create whatever I wanted. And believe me, I've been advised over the years so many times that I was all over the place. Pick one subject and become known for that. I hated that advice and I refused to follow it. Vision is what's left over when you remove all of your fears and insecurities, when you stop complying and conforming, when you ignore what others are doing and you pursue what you love. There is great power in not caring. The Faroe Islands. I was watching the TV show Shetland on BBC and all the time the actors were on screen, I was always looking past them at the coastline. And I just loved how the Shetland looked. And I decided off I was going to go to the Shetland Islands, but I had no idea where it was at. So I hop on Google Maps and start looking for it. And then I get distracted because I see the Faroe Islands and they looked even more isolated. There's these 17 little islands out in the middle of nowhere. And so off I went for a month. What a glorious trip this was. If you were a color photographer, you'd love it. The brightest greens I've ever seen in my life. Changing weather. If it wasn't good in one island, you went to another island. And it's part of the time, it felt like you were in the 1700s. These old stone buildings with moss all over them and sod roofs. And then you're traveling to another island in an undersea tunnel. Well-lit wide highway under the sea. What a dichotomy in contrast. Every day I would come out of this one tunnel and I would see this scene and I would photograph it. I must have photographed that 50 times. And this is the image that I loved most of that whole trip. So how long do projects take? Well, I've got projects I've been doing for 15 years and they're not done. I showed you the trees from a train that took 12 hours. And now I'd like to show you a project that I completed in less than two hours. 
because they just take as long as they take. The ghosts of Auschwitz-Birkenau. I mentioned my son was in Ukraine and we had a couple of extra days, so we decided to go to Poland, took a train ride over to Poland. And while there, we stayed in the city center of Krakow. Now I knew that the death camps were nearby and the family were discussing what we should do. And I was hoping they wouldn't want to go. I didn't want to. I don't like sad places. I don't like sad things, sad stories, sad movies. But the family voted and off we were to go to Auschwitz-Birkenau. We took a tour bus. And because I didn't want to leave my expensive equipment in the apartment, I brought it with me. But as we traveled there, I decided I would not photograph at the death camp because I thought it would be perhaps sacrilegious or at least irreverent. So as we were getting off the bus, I asked the driver if I could leave my gear on board and he said, no, I won't be responsible. So I begin the tour with my equipment. The first thing you see on the tour is this book. On the left, a beautiful black and white photograph, clearly a skilled photographer. And on the right, they describe the person, their possessions, their belongings, their education, their occupation. And your, your, your mind begins to swirl a little bit. Why are you so carefully documenting someone you're going to either work to death or murder? Then they took us into the room with the iconic piles. There's a pile of glasses, three foot high. The piles of human hair used to stuff mattresses and pillows. And the most sickening of all, the pile of human bridge work yanked from the mouths of the dead. I'm not claustrophobic, but I could not breathe in that room. And I signaled to my family that I was gonna go outside and they should continue the tour. Once outside, I just walked slowly looking at my feet and I started to breathe easier, but then I started thinking about my feet. The steps that I took, who else took these steps on their way to the gallows? Who else had walked in the same path on their way to the gas chamber? Then I began to wonder metaphorically if the spirits of those people who lived and died at Auschwitz-Birkenau still lingered. And then like a lightning bolt, it just hit me, I needed to photograph those ghosts. And so I began photographing ghosts. I used long exposures to photograph the other visitors at the camp, turning them into ghosts. They stood in proxy for those who lived and died there. One of the biggest challenges was that I, as I set up my tripod and camera, the people would clear out of the area, not wanting to ruin my shot. Unbeknownst to them, I needed them in my shot. And so I devised very quickly a technique. I turned my back on the camera, played the part of the loud American, spoke loudly into my cell phone, and using a remote shutter release, would take the shot once they had gone back into the area. The other challenge was that I was only there for 45 minutes left at Auschwitz and then an hour at Birkenau. So I literally was running from location to location, photographing these ghosts. This is the only image that I included a live person and it had meaning to me what that meant. And it's been surprising to me. I've heard at least a dozen other interpretations of what this image means with a live person and ghosts. And lastly, the ghost escaping from the gas chamber. I never could bring myself to go into the chamber, nor could I ever go back to another death camp, I fear. One of the biggest blessings of this project has been that I have been able to meet Holocaust survivors as I've exhibited this work at different Holocaust museums. I was exhibiting at the Dallas Holocaust Museum when I saw this woman, Edith Molnar, being pushed around in a wheelchair. And at every image, she leaned way forward in the chair and closely examined the images. So I went up to her and I introduced myself and said, hi, my name is Cole and these are my images. And I remember her raising this bony, crooked finger. It was shaking as she pointed at this photo and she said, these are my images. Edith Molnar had been interned at Auschwitz-Birkenau and had survived. And I couldn't fathom what she must think as she looked at those images. I also was privileged to speak to over 100 survivors at the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles on the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. 
And I got to tell you, when you shake hands with these people and hear their stories person to person, it is amazing. And talk about a shiver going down my spine. They are like living history. So final tip tonight, what's the easiest way to make money from fine art photography? Of course, you probably have guessed the answer, sell your equipment. There's not a lot of Ansel Adams who can earn a living on their fine art photography, but that's not why I do it. I do it because I want to express myself. There's something in me that I want to get out. I'm not good expressing my emotions, so I use pictures that hopefully can speak a thousand words for me. Summary, three-legged dogs are awesome, and so is black and white. The real key is your vision. Forget the rules. Best to never learn them. Don't follow other people's advice, not about your vision. Learn to let go of all those vision blockers and listen to the music. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop my share now and turn on my camera. Wonderful, Cole. Thank you. That was great. Uh, I'm not only applying it to my photography as you're talking, but also to writing work I try to do. All, all the things you said really fit. Um, there was a question uh, on the um, chat, which was, do you ever process in color? Uh, I understood you to say you, you do basic processing in color, but then you shift to black and white right away. Yeah, and if they mean, do I ever do color images? I don't. Uh, I actually have two color images I've ever done on my website, and that's it. Okay. I, I, I invite people to please either express your thoughts and opinions or to ask questions. I would love to hear from you. I, I think you've taken uh, people's words away because you've answered so many questions already. But there's a lot of positive messages here. So unmute yourself if you have a direct question for Cole. Lots Thank of messages. You, do you... Hi, it's Scott Tamlin here. Hi, Scott. Uh, let me just... Uh... Yourself on, or maybe not. Um, how how does one know that something is one's vision? How did how do you know if it's coming from your vision? It you comes to you. I'm sorry. Can you clarify? You said you said in your presentation that your vision came to you. Yes. How did you know that it that was your vision? I think you answered it a bit, but. No, I, I didn't really address that directly. Uh, you know, I said it took me two years and I got so discouraged at times I was just gonna give up. And there were times that truthfully, I was afraid to find out the answer, do you have a vision? Because I thought to myself, what happens if I find out I don't have a vision? What are the implications for my photographic aspirations? But right. I stuck it out. And then just one day I realized I had been using it mostly it went to my motives. Why was I creating this image? Was I creating it to impress others, to show others and get pats on the back, to win, to get likes, to be published? And when I finally got to a place where I created only for myself and I didn't care, I knew I was creating from my vision. Thank you. Uh, there's a question. Can you share again how you did the images on the train? Okay. Imagine you're on the train, you're looking out the window and you see a train, uh, it's going 50 miles per hour and a tree whizzes by. I had about three seconds to look ahead, identify a tree that I wanted to put in the center of the frame because the center of the frame for some reason didn't have the swirls. It, the swirls seemed to occur on the outside. So I put it to about a half second exposure, hand the image, keeping that tree right in the center and hit the shutter. And because of the movement of the tree, the movement of the train, and the movement of my camera, and the movement of the focal plane shutter, all of those things combined tended to make the swirl except for the, the subject. And like I said, I didn't understand what had happened until later. And it wasn't important at the time. It just was there, and I was having fun with it. That's cool. Um, someone says, uh, I, know, I see you're mostly landscape orientation. Can you comment, clarify related to street photography, which is very much candid in the moment most times? 
Well, I, I, as a kid, I used to do it. I, I don't tend to shoot people very much anymore, so I don't know if I can offer you know, an educated opinion, but I don't think vision has to do even with photography. It really just has to do with being this self-confident person who says, I know what I want and I'm going to do it. And I have to believe that applies to street photography as well as any other type of photography. Um, Gary, you, I think you said something about this. F finding my vision initially, I thought would affect only my photography. It really changed my entire life. Mm -hmm. I now do what I want to do. And I don't, you know, I don't want to sound rude about it. I don't care if somebody doesn't like how I do something. So mm -hmm. I think vision's a liberating thing. Yeah. Can I make a technical comment? John's often. Okay. John? Yeah. Um, it's a technical comment. It was a brilliant presentation. It's, you have a rare gift. But could I make the comment that one hour, 25 minutes is too long for one presentation? It just, okay. I found myself zoning out. And I think that's most people's recommendations is no, not more than three quarters of an hour to an hour. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, back to what you were saying, you uh, certainly reached uh, Elaine Grandin. She writes, I th that I think was the best presentation I've ever attended at ICM, and I feel like I have to defend it a lot. Not anymore. Thank you very much. I could yeah. listen to this for uh, two or three hours. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, David. I'm it's, the same. Uh, it, it, I'm the I, same. Didn't, I didn't even feel at the hour, hour 25. I didn't feel it at all. I didn't even check my clock. Lee, is it Lisa? Were you saying something? Yes, I said I would have listened to more of it. More okay. of you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Very inspiring. Well, thank you very much. You bet. And I guess uh, you don't you don't speak French, do you? Uh, pardon? You don't speak French, do you? Do you speak French? I took one. I excuse me. I failed one semester of French in seventh grade, and that's as far as I got. Oh well, good enough. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Good. <laughs> Very inspiring. So cool, Steve here. I've been a huge fan of your work for several years and I've followed yours and listened and read your advice in your newsletter and it's been quite inspiring. And I've tried to figure out how to tap it in my own work. Um, what, and one thing I'm curious about because you, you neither seek nor want um, praise or other people's opinion on your work. But as you move through life, your work seems to be getting more attention and more fame. So how do you not allow that to distract you or, or does it distract you? That's a great question. I tell people that criticism is hard. It stings, it hurts, sometimes it discourages. But praise is so much more dangerous, at least for me, because it can turn my head and it can make me start if I get a lot of praise about a certain image, I find myself wanting to do those types of images because it got that praise. So I work so hard to keep a level head, to really not care. I hate using that same phrase and to just do what I want to do. Uh, I, selfishness is not a good thing, except for an art. I think art deserves to be a selfish pursuit. So I have to really work hard at it, Steve, because I am easily swayed by praise and by, you know, the publicity that I get. Thanks. What have you photographed during the pandemic? Cause you could not travel, nothing. I uh, haven't been able to travel. I was supposed to go to Easter Island again this year. I was supposed to go to the Faroe Islands again this year. I was supposed to go to New Zealand this year, all off the table. And then on top of it, my son unfortunately got divorced and he and his boys are living with us. So I've, as he finishes college, I've become the parent. So, and I don't regret it. Um, sometimes there's downtimes and the benefit of a downtime is that you really get this hungry desire to get back out and create. So I know when I start doing that again, it'll be fun, so. Were there any other questions in the written part, Gary, that I thought not, I saw in the last just, just so many people inspired what you've said, uh, that they, they never zoned out, uh, the time flew by. Um, 
could have listened and enjoyed your images for a lot longer. This kept me going, always a new thought and more to consider to grow. So lots of thank positive you. stuff. And I, I sure echo that. Okay, uh, thanks this, everyone. This was a very helpful presentation. Your, your way of thinking about it really does fly in the face of what tends to happen in club activities where we think we're being helpful by trying to give feedback and suggest what could be different and trying to teach the rules, which I'm guilty of in a, a special interest group I run for new, new photographers. So it's, it's really refreshing what you're saying. I uh, love speaking to camera clubs for that very reason. I know there are people out there in every group I speak to who wants more, but they're not sure what it is because I was that way. And I hope my message says, however you want to do it, go and do it and quit listening to other people. And mm -hmm. if I reach one person per presentation with that message, I'm very happy. Mm -hmm. And whoever said Vancouver Island, that's my... Uh, I don't think I told anyone this, but my first trip, once I can get out again, is to Vancouver Island to spend a month. I used to live in Nanaimo. I know part of the island, but I want to spend a lot of time there. So I will be there. Yeah. I was going to say, if you come to Vancouver Island, um, if you come in September, I could direct you to a tour which may be taking part, uh, taking place from uh, the mid, mid part of the island to the main coast where you can have grizzly bears walking mm. past you at 10 feet mm. without being, being in a cage. Perhaps Why do they pass them. and they don't stop? They always look, they look at you out of the corner of their eye and keep on going in a straight line. <laughs> But you have to be a group of about 20 because that intimidates them. It reminds me of that old joke, you don't need to outrun a bear. You just yeah. need to outrun the other person with you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, John. I appreciate that. Any other comments or questions before uh, I give a print uh, away? Cole, you were saying that don't listen to anybody, but it's very difficult not listening to you. <laughs> well, yeah. I hopefully what I'm telling you is listen to yourself. Yeah. Uh, I just saw someone, I think I wrote it down. Was it Jano who said you grew up in Nanaimo? All right, I lived there in 73. Yeah, cool. Well, I love to give a print away of the angel Gabriel after each presentation. So we're going to do that tonight. And how we do that is, who's got a birthday today? I'll give you a second to unmute. David, you're, you've appeared on screen. Is that because you have a birthday today? No, I think my, my, uh, I wish I did, but uh, unfortunately I don't. I think my hand must have touched the space bar. I, I've never had someone with a birthday today. How about someone who's had a birthday a couple of days either before today or a couple of days after today? I know Kathy Kane had one March 7th. Anybody beat that? March 7th, that's pretty close. Anybody closer? 7th and today's what, the 11th? We That's have four days. Anybody can beat four days. We have March 14th there. 14th. Oh my gosh, is that a tie? Somebody uh, says Wendy has her birthday today. Who does? Wendy. Wendy, oh. where's Wendy? Which Wendy? Or. Wendy or is she on the call? Well, I think it needs to be somebody on. So Corinne. Yeah. Oh. Okay, who had it on the 14th? That's three days. Yes, Overwater. Wendy's on the call. She is? Yeah. yeah. She's just pretty yeah. quiet. Oh, okay. Well, maybe she doesn't want to admit she got a birthday today. <laughs> I'm the print. Uh, Wendy, you'd need to uh, unmute yourself if you want to speak up. Otherwise, Corinne, I think, is going to. Yeah. <laughs> Wendy, Wendy, come out, come out wherever you are. Okay, it looks like it's going to be Corinne who wins. Are Yay. you the one who had the 14th? That's correct. Okay. Oh, well, that's really nice. <laughs> okay. Would you please, Corinne, you need to do two things. Email me with your address and a phone number because I can't ship okay. to Canada without a phone number. Oh, I'm really excited. I love the image. It's amazing. I loved your, <laughs> I loved everything about tonight. I hope you'll remember the story. <laughs> And I will send you his email address. 
Okay, great. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you all. I really do appreciate it. Love you Canadians. Let me in. I've, I've got a petition I'd like you all to sign. It's called Let Coal in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get my second vaccination here on the 23rd. Maybe they'll let me in then. And yeah, we don't even have our first. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay. I'll let you all get on with your meeting. And um, do you know, Gary, if you are able to save those chat comments so that I can be able to look at those? I definitely intend to do that. I have something going first thing in the morning, so it'll be sometime probably Saturday that I get no them. No worries. Just as long as they could be saved. I'd love to see what people's input were. Yeah, you'll definitely get that. Thank you Thanks, so Jackie. much. Thanks, Jackie. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Bye. Uh, before the rest of you go, I uh, just want to uh, tell you to say May, save May 1st. May 1st is a uh, Saturday. Uh, the camera store is going to be putting on a virtual product showcase initiated by the six clubs in the uh, Alberta Interclub Collaboration Project. Uh, they're, um, they have great plans for how they're going to conduct it. They're looking at uh, getting uh, the use of software that was created by the Comic-Con folks, the folks that put on a, a major trade show um, every year and uh, they've had to go virtual. So they developed software for doing that. Uh, we'll hear more about the details of it, but uh, September. We're gonna save it on your calendar. We're gonna have uh, a presenter through Christian Bogner will be part of it. Uh, they're looking at getting uh, uh, more than nine uh, vendors to speak. Oh, I know this flies in the face of what Cole was saying about uh, sell your gear, but uh, uh, there's lots of things that the vendors will share with us. And some of it may be uh, just photography ideas and tips because they may not choose to do much about product as much as just sharing information. However, they'll be invited to talk about their favorite products. <laughs> So that'll be during the day. We don't know the exact time, but I imagine 10 in the morning till still in. <clears throat> okay, that's it for me at Clayton, unless you want to add something. No, you covered it pretty well. Just want everyone to know to save May 1st so that uh, you have time on that day to enjoy the show because it's going to be an absolutely incredible day and a freebie to all our club members. So make sure you write her down May 1st. And there'll be uh, door prizes and uh, they're going to discount product for the show. Uh, work at doing that. So thank you all for being there. We've got up to 131 and uh, it was a good audience and a great presentation, I think. So thank you. Um, I'm a guest and then do that. David, David is at the Victoria Camera Club. Uh, uh, Cole said that we can distribute this video, so I will get it out to... Uh, Richard and Richard can figure out how to handle it for the club. I'll do that with all the clubs that have participated. Okay. Thank all you. Right. Thank you for inviting us. Right. You're welcome. You're welcome. It's a reciprocal uh, arrangement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Gary. Thanks, Colin.